Well, today I'm going to talk to you about the future of the Libertarian Party. And I'm going to start out by talking about some things that might sound a little bit discouraging at first. But please don't go there, because I'm going to end my talk with the closest thing I think we'll ever have to a silver bullet. So I, I hope the talk will be encouraging in the long run rather than discouraging. But before I begin, I know if I were listening to someone talking about the future of the Libertarian Party, I'd want to know a little more about them because how do they know what's going on, right? So I'm going to do something I rarely do. I'm going to talk more about myself uh, in the first part of the talk than I normally would do. Normally I just rely on the introduction and I will go fast. Okay, so I've been an LP candidate in so many races I can't count them anymore. And I started in 1983. I was a a champion ballot access gatherer in Michigan. We had to do it every four years because we always lost our ballot access during the presidential race. Um, I've actually been a contender twice for the LP presidential nomination and twice for the VP. I've been elected as an at-large member to the LNC three times. So I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot in the Libertarian Party, but I've also been part of the nonprofit movement. I've been a board member for Heartland, FIJA. I'm currently chair of the International Society for Individual Liberty and secretary for the Foundation for a Free Society, a Texas-based nonprofit that we'll talk about in a little bit. I'm also an author, as Jay mentioned. Um, my book, Healing Our World, has won three awards and it's been translated in several Eastern European languages. It's kind of a libertarian primer for uh, liberals, environmentalists, pragmatists, and Christians. And I also have the short answers to the tough questions that the Advocates has put out uh, in an expanded edition uh, last year. And it kind of encompasses 15 years of the web column, my Ask Dr. Ruart column that Jay referred to. Um, I'm currently working on a book on the FDA. Great topic, we'll talk a little more about that in my second talk. Um, I've also been associated with Ron Paul. He endorsed Healing Our World. He wrote me a letter of endorsement uh, to become the FDA commissioner uh, back when McClellan actually ended up getting it. And I'm in the um, For Liberty film on the Ron Paul Revolution. So I've been, uh, been around in various uh, capacities in the movement. And this is why I think I might have something to share with you today that might be helpful. So let's talk about where the Libertarian Party is. You know, when we started, we were the gateway to the libertarian movement, but that's no longer true. And in many ways, that's a good thing. We've got a lot of other organizations out there, like the Students for Liberty, the Ron Paul movement, the nonprofits, people can come in. And that's a wonderful thing. But it is competition. And like all entities, when we have competition, we need to put out our best foot, because if we don't, you know, we're going to lose out. We're not going to be able to uh, enjoy the fruits of this expansion of the libertarian movement. Now, one of the things that's been happening in recent years is we've been soft-selling our message. And I think this is something that's actually hurt us, because uh, let's face it, we had a Republican candidate in 2008 uh, for the presidential nomination that was more libertarian than the person who actually won our nomination in 2008. And this really messes with our brand. I don't think this is a good idea. As, as the Republicans are becoming more radical, or at least as there's an additional movement that's becoming more radical, um, if we aren't more radical than they are, uh, we're going to get left in the dust because we lose our unique selling proposition as the marketers uh, talk about it. So I think that's been a mistake that we've made. And basically what I'm telling you is I think we're going in the wrong direction right now. But again, I don't want to discourage anybody because I think what we've done up to now is going to help us to go in the right direction. We also define winning as winning office rather than winning liberty. I think in the focus of trying to say we are a political party, we should elect people to office, we may have taken that a bit too far and now we have candidates that are you know, really thinking about soft selling the message so they can get votes. I think this is a mistake, as I'll explain further as we go through this. So, let's continue on. If I can make it continue on. Oh, yes. I want to talk a little bit about something we all know about, the wasted vote syndrome. We always knew it was big. 
I think it's a lot bigger than we ever anticipated. And the data that suggests this to me, and most of you know I'm a research scientist by profession, so excuse me if I talk about data, it's just the way I am. Um, you know, 2008, Ron Paul was the only liberty candidate on the ballot in Louisiana. And that's because the Libertarian Party didn't get their candidate on. We turned in our signatures late, I think. I'm not quite sure what all the, all the uh, things that happened there were about. But. And yet he came in first or second in the Republican primary. Now, he only got a half percent of the vote. Same that Bob Barr got that year. Um, same that he got, actually, in the in his run when he was the LP candidate in 88. And, you know, if ever there was going to be a chance to see what would happen when there are a lot of liberty-minded people that supported the candidate, whether they would vote for him or not, we found out that they, they really didn't. Even people who supported Ron Paul in Louisiana were not willing to vote for him when he was the only liberty candidate on the ballot. They wanted to vote for one of the lesser of two evils. And this is very sad, very sad, because it means the waste of vote center is really big. Of course, there could be another explanation for this. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. Oops. And. You might say, okay, if we have the wasted vote soon because we're a third party, let's take over the GOP. Well, that hasn't worked so well either. Ron Paul tried that. And basically, he got the number of states, I think it was five, that he needed. He won five states in his last presidential run. He should have been able to be a presidential candidate for the GOP, but when he got to the convention, the rules had changed. Now you needed, I think it was 11 states. And so, at the last minute, the GOP changed the rules to exclude him. So this is what happens when we try to go through a major part. So this is very discouraging as well. And the other part of all this, if you look at our vote counts, which are so low, there is some reason to believe that the counting is not accurate. Now I've cited here for, uh, for you to see the, the uh, film Hacking Democracy, which is on the web at blackboxvoting.org. But I have personally experienced some hanky-panky in the voting booth. Um, in, uh, back in the uh, mid-90s, I moved to Kentucky, and I, wasn't, I didn't have enough residency to run as a candidate myself, so I was a campaign manager for our sheriff candidate. Now, the sheriff candidate was allowed to watch the counting. And as the boxes came in, because this is paper voting at that time, as the boxes came in, they were supposed to be sealed. They had a tape that went on the top and on the side of the box. And there was a number on the top and a number on the side, and those were supposed to match, right? It's the same tape. Well, according to our sheriff candidate, all the boxes that came in were mismatched. In other words, the numbers didn't match. They had been opened and, the, and something maybe had gone on with the ballots. So, you know, we protested to the uh, election commission and they did investigate two years later. So, too late to make any difference. Now, he also was told by his friends, because this is a small county, he knows everybody, he's lived there all his life, he was told by three of, I'm sorry, three of his friends that they had voted for him absentee. When they counted the absentee ballots, he only got one absentee vote. So, you know, things are going on. There was another situation in Nevada where one lady ran for state rep and she had people outside the uh, voting area that were doing exit polls. The exit polls showed that she had won the race about 67 to 33%. But when the results came in, they were switched. She lost. She only had 33%. So again, some reason to think there's a lot of hanky-panky going on in the vote county, which really shouldn't surprise us um, because we know that it's no secret that it's not the people who vote the count, it's the people who count the votes. So we have a lot going against us as libertarians trying to get elected. We have the wasted vote syndrome, we have the highly probable scenario of our votes not being counted. And of course, I haven't even talked about ballot access, which of course is a major hurdle too. 
So this is this is very sad. Now, to counter all this, some people have proposed that what we do is we put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, and really work hard to elect one or two people to Congress. So I'd like to talk about that strategy for just a moment. First of all, of course, not everyone agrees that's a good idea, but let's just say we did for the sake of our argument. And what happens if we actually elect one or two people in Congress? What would happen? Well, we already know because we've had Ron Paul in Congress, right? And think about it. How effective was he? He was a great watchdog. You know, and I'm, I'm a Ron Paul fan, so, you know, he's a great watchdog, but when he told us about the Patriot Act, could he stop it being passed? No. He wasn't able to do that. Was he able to get major legislation passed? Well, he's one person. You know, you need the majority in Congress to pass it. So it's hard for one or two people to be effective. When Andre Maru in 1992, our candidate, went to Dixville Notch, he had a plan. He knew that Dixville Notch reported out their voting results before anyone else in the country. And this was usually a big deal. So he went to Dixville Notch and he talked to all the 28 people that were gonna vote that year. And he convinced them to vote for him. So he won Dixville Notch in 1992. But you know what? Did you see headlines saying, oh, Libertarian wins Dixville Notch? Any of you remember that? Probably not, because the media did not bring that to the fore. You had to really dig to find that out. And that's another thing. The media tends to be anti-libertarian. They don't want to shout our victories from the rooftop, so it's very tough. So maybe that's not such a great strategy. But I think there is a strategy that works. And it took me 30 years to figure it out, so I'm hoping that you will, if you think it's a good one, get it right away and implement it and not, not take as long as I did <laughs> to figure it out. What we have to do is figure out what we really want. And I'm going to ask you to vote since, you know, we're a party, we should vote, right? What do we really want? Oops, I went backwards. Do we want to elect one to two members to Congress in the next couple of election cycles? Or do we want to roll back big government today? I'd like to see a show of hands. How many want people elected to Congress? One or two people elected to Congress. Okay. How many people want to roll back big government today? And how many people aren't sure? I'd people like. To I'd like to vote twice. You like to vote. Twice. <laughs> I'd like to vote. Right, right. But if you had to choose, okay. Democrat. All right. So, can we do that? You know what? We can, and we have. And I want to talk about that because this is. This is a part that you never hear about, I shouldn't say never, hardly ever hear about in the Libertarian Party. So to show you how I first picked up on this, I'm going to go back to 1983 and talk about the Kalamazoo City Commission race at that time. Um, basically, there were four uh, Libertarians that were running for City Commission, and we added uh, Francis uh, Hamilton, I don't know if you can see that, uh, who was already elected to the city commission, he was what we would call a libertarian-leaning conservative. So we added it to our slate. This is supposed to be a nonpartisan election, but the libertarians put together the slate. Um, you know, as you can see, I'm there too. And please excuse the graphics. This is pre-computer. We had to cut and paste this. Okay, so there were what I'm gonna call the establishment slate which were the people who were already elected. Francis Hamilton was on both of them. Um, there was the, uh, there was like what I would call probably a green slate and a liberal slate, even more liberal than the already elected city commission. Well, the press didn't like us any better than they like libertarians today. So they kept calling us libertarians and bringing up all those tough issues that libertarians hesitate some time to talk about, like the fact that we want to legalize drugs, we want to do away with the IRS. But remember this is 83. We don't have any research yet showing that the drug war kills more people than the drugs themselves. We are the only people advocating abolition of the IRS. And of course all the other things that you know we talk about as libertarians. So we had to answer all those questions. I mean we got grilled on everything libertarian. 
and we were very radical, and we gave the radical moral position because we had no data to back up our positions. Today, um, for example, Healing Our World contains over a thousand references of how liberty works in the real world. We didn't have any of that back in 83. We could only stand on principle. And we did. And amazingly enough, we came in second. Our slate came in second. And Francis Hamilton became mayor because in the city of Kalamazoo, uh, the mayor is the highest vote getter. So he got, he won by the number of votes that our slate got. And he was really excited about that. It was, it was a record breaking in Kalamazoo and he appointed Cheryl and I to the uh, public safety task force. We were probably the first two uh, appointed libertarians. But that's not where our victory was. Our victory came after we lost the election. The city of Kalamazoo was trying to have a rail consolidation program. You know, Kalamazoo is a little city. But they decided that instead of ticketing trains that took more than five minutes to cross the highway, they would simply reroute all the trains and make these overpasses and things of this nature. It would have been the biggest tax boondoggle that Kalamazoo ever saw. And to get the land for this, they were taking it by eminent domain. So, of course, the libertarians went to a... a we went to a meeting of concerned citizens, and someone, an older gentleman, he was about 30 years older than I at the time, he came up to me and he put $200 in cash in my hand before he said a word to me. And he said, Dr. Ruart, they're taking my bicycle shop that my brother and I have built up for the last 30 years, they're taking it away by eminent domain. He said, Dr. Ruart, I know your employer, the Upjohn Company, is going to get a lot of land from the Zeman domain. But you, Dr. Ruart, are a libertarian. So I know you're on my side. Take this money and fight them for me. Now, a lot happened in those moments that I didn't catch on to for many, many years. First of all, he put the money in my hand before he even said a word, right? And here I am with a major conflict of interest. If I speak out, I could get fired because my employer is benefiting. And yet he had total faith in me because of the way we ran that campaign. Totally on principle, no data to back us up, just the moral, the moral argument. And of course, we did fight it and we did win. And of course, libertarians weren't the only ones that were fighting it, a lot of other people did too. And that went down in flames. We rolled back the big government land and tax grab, and we didn't elect a single libertarian. That's powerful. But we weren't the only ones doing that. If you read the LP News back in the 80s, you saw other examples where parties were thwarting tax hikes, lowering taxes, getting rid of eminent domain. A lot of things were happening. Now, think about it. When we run our candidates and we tell people what we're about, they can have a lot of faith in us. They want to come to somebody who helps them out when they're in trouble because big government comes knocking at their door. Who do they call? Hopefully they call us. And that can happen. And we can win there. Actually, that's something we do well. We haven't won many big elections. We've had three state reps at a time, I think in New Hampshire and two in Alaska. We haven't won a lot of high office, but what we have done is we've won at the local level. And when I say local level, I'm not really just talking about, well, let me, let me go back for a minute. Think about this. If I ran for city commission again, do you think that bicycle shop owner would have voted for me? You bet, because I helped save his bicycle shop. Do you think he would have voted libertarian or paid attention to our message? You bet, because we had saved his bicycle shop. We can be heroes. And in fact, there's another group in the movement that's doing just that. It's a nonprofit, the Institute for Justice, and it is actually one of the most successful nonprofits that we have. Um, I didn't, yeah, I put their website on here in case you want to check them out. Um, they are a bunch of libertarian lawyers, and what they did to their claim to fame right now is going to Supreme Court on eminent domain, but they started 
by being the, pe the, the group that people went to when the government came knocking at the door, especially the disadvantaged. What they did is disadvantaged hair braiders, taxi drivers, people who were getting driven out of business by big government came to them and they represented them pro bono and they won. Now, having been to the Supreme Court, when IJ takes on a case, they start with a letter to the government and say, um, you know, if you don't stop this, we're going to go after you. And oftentimes that's all it takes. The government backs down because they've exercised their ability enough to win <laughs> and to be the heroes, to be the savior of these people that big government knows that they better stay away. Now, wouldn't you like to see the Libertarian Party in that position? We send a letter, either a local Libertarian Party or a national Libertarian Party, and say, we're going after you if you don't stop this and have them back down. I think that would be pretty powerful. And in fact, you know, <laughs> we've actually done that, but it's not well celebrated in the movement. Uh, for example, this is probably the one that most of you know about. Steve Covey, a Libertarian, and one of the first medical marijuana patients, uh, along with the Libertarian Party and colleagues in California, passed the first medical marijuana law. And that resulted in other people. This is at the state level. So, you know, it's not just the local level, state level. And what happened is it's kind of ballooned out into a national level because other states started passing medical marijuana laws. And just last year, two states legalized marijuana completely. Now, what's important about this is the drug war goes down, marijuana goes down, because more than half the arrests are for marijuana smokers and dealers. Why? Because it's much safer for the police to arrest them than it is for a heroin or crack addict, right, that might pull out a semi-automatic. So the marijuana, if marijuana is legalized, the drug war ends. And Ron Krippenberger, one of our late and great members, had once proposed that we go after the drug war and take credit for its demise. And if it does go down, it's probably going to be because of the efforts of libertarians like Steve Covey. In fact, another, another um, drug war story, of course, is the story of Carol Ayn Rand, who was going to run against Bob Barr. Um, she was going to run as a libertarian, but Bob Barr had to run the Republican primaries and get the nomination. While he was still an incumbent, it should have been a slam dunk. But Carol Ann Rand cleverly ran ads of a medical marijuana patient, an old lady laying in her hospital bed saying, Bob Barr wants to take away my medicine. Why do you want to do that, Bob? And he could not win his own primary. She took him down without any libertarian being elected. Just as Steve Covey took down uh, some of, at least some of the drug war in California by having by passing Proposition 215. Now, of course, he had help, and the beauty of it is we would all have help on issues like these, and you get to talk to people, the other collaborators, and they're going to listen because you're standing there in the trenches with them. They want to hear what you have to say. What a wonderful opportunity to introduce people to libertarianism. And I want to talk about a national issue. So, because I talked about two state issues. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Clinton Care was basically defeated by libertarians in 1993. The reason I know this is I was one of them working against it. And whenever you read in the Wall Street Journal or anywhere else about somebody speaking out against Clinton Care, you could recognize about 80% of them were libertarian. And uh, uh, my collaborator, uh, Jared Wolstein, and myself put out a book, Lethal Compassion, The Cure That Kills. He actually went on radio and debated some of the top officials in the Clinton administration and read the bill back to them when they would say something and show that they were contradicting themselves. It was brilliant. And Clinton Care went down, and it's largely due to libertarians, and most people don't know this. So this activism I'm talking about this rolling back big government without necessarily electing anyone is something that libertarians are very good at and have done for a long time. So what I'm suggesting is the LP can become a power player. And I'm not saying don't run. Obviously, you need to run. We have to advertise who we are. And of course, win races when we can. I'm not against winning. Don't get me wrong. If we can win the race, let's do it. 
But you know, that's not where our power lies. Because winning one race or two races, even at a high level, isn't going to roll back big government. But you know, again, to do that, we have to make sure that we put out the libertarian message. If we don't, if we don't establish our brand, then, and our brand is someone who supports the non-aggression principle, people won't know where we stand. It's very clear, on most issues at least, where we stand when we tell people where we're coming from. So we could be the Ghostbusters, so to speak, um, that people come to when Big Brother comes knocking on their door. And so I, I think the way we can define winning as a party is rolling back big government where we have lots of victories in the past and could have many, many more in the future, whether or not we elect an LP candidate. And the nice thing about this is when you're working on issues, you keep your party alive in between campaigns. Usually what happens is people get all excited in the presidential election, your numbers go up and then they plunge afterwards. This is true at the national level too. They plunge afterwards and, and you have not much going on until the next election cycle. But this way you can have something going on all the time. There's always an issue that needs fighting. And that brings people together, it brings you in touch with your collaborators to share the message. And then of course, you know, you can have an opportunity to share the message with interested people, with activists who are already on the ground uh, doing something about rolling back big government. There's one other thing I'd like to point out that isn't talked about much, but we're going to see, I believe, a big movement for states to overturn what's happening at the federal level. Um, for example, we have the two states that have already legalized marijuana. I am sure the federal government's going to come in there and try to squash that, and I think the states are gonna fight back. The states are already fighting back on Obamacare. 34 states have refused to set up an exchange. We're going to be having lots of battles on Obamacare coming up. So I'm gonna suggest that you may want to uh, get up to speed on this nullification movement and the um, foundation that I'm secretary for, the Foundation for a Free Society, has put out an award-winning documentary on the subject. You can get it on their website at f4fs.org. So I, uh, if you haven't heard of that, if you're not familiar with what's going on there, I suggest you look into that because that's an area where libertarians will have a great opportunity as individuals and as parties to support something that's big. And I think it's big because if the states nullify the federal government, it sets a precedent for the counties to nullify what the states do. And for the local cities to nullify what the counties do and for the individuals to nullify everything else. <laughs> So I think that gives us an opportunity that uh, whose time has come. I'm going to end there because I know we have some crazy time restrictions. Um, I don't know if I have time for questions or not. I'll leave that decision to Jay. Oh, we will be seeing Mary again, but if anyone has any quick questions. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I claim uh, exemption from uh, the uh, top subject of my question because in uh, 2008, I believe it was, uh, I voted six times for you. But my question is, why do you think Bob Barr actually got the nomination? That was my question too. Well, uh, first of all, I have to say I don't know for sure, but I was told by um, people that should know that he uh, had two truckloads of people, of delegates, coming in to fill the empty slots. I don't know if that was true or not, but that's what I've been told. And if that's true, then what that meant is people coming in might not have known the whole story. And um, I have actually had a number of people, many, many people actually come up to me afterwards and say, you know, they were really sorry they did vote for Bob Barr. But I think one of the big reasons that the delegates on the floor before the busloads <laughs> uh, was that we had a, there was a poll, and the poll actually um, said that Bob Barr was getting 6% of the vote. And of course it turned out he didn't get that, but we routinely seem to poll higher as libertarians than we do actually get votes at the ballot box. Is that because people change their mind, or is that because the votes aren't properly counted? I don't know. Yes? 
first of all, thank you for coming here. This was a wonderful presentation. And thank you for talking about the issue of voting transparency in the black boxes. And my question to you is how do we approach that as a party? How do we make that an issue without sounding like we're complaining or we're whining because we didn't win? How do we you know, show people that we have a serious issue here and it's totally not partisan? Well, that's a very good question. How do we bring the black box voting to the attention of people? I, I think it's hard to do it as a party for the reason you said, but that doesn't mean that we can't promote the, you know, having our neighbors and friends see the film. It's, you know, something we can do. And I think the film was very compelling. It certainly was for me, at least. So I would, I would suggest that we just point people that way, and then they can make their decision. The problem is it is hard to do anything about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you think about the mechanics of it, it's always, I mean, dead people have been voting for a long time, right? So I'm not sure what the solution to that is. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about running for mayor of my town, but we have all these state mandates and federal mandates. And I would lo love to say the null and void, but then we don't get state grants or federal grants. How would you handle that? <clears throat> well, that is a difficult situation. You see, the states and the um, I'm sorry, the, even, yes, even the states. What, what happens is the Fed takes all of our money and then offers it back to us if we go ahead and institute their mandate. So, you know, it's kind of a catch-22. It's very, very difficult. I think the way I have handled this in the past that has been successful is I point out to people, hey, we send X number of dollars to Washington and we get half of that back. That's not a good deal for us. Let's get rid of getting it, giving it to Washington in the first place. I think that's a simple answer that resonates. And really, that's the only answer that works. Even if you're elected as a libertarian, you can, of course, if, if you have enough support, refuse to accept that money. And I do know that there are occasionally towns that elect libertarians and don't do it, but it's a tough sell. Yes? In 97, we had Murray Sabrin run for governor in the state. And in the town of Keyport, which my mother lived in at the time, her and another woman, a friend of hers, voted for Murray. And the next day, I looked in the Asbury Park Press for a day later, and it showed zero votes for Murray Sabrin in the town of Keyport. Mm -hmm. And either my mother lied to me, <laughs> but I waterboarded her. <laughs> or it was voted, you know, they didn't count the vote. Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, I think there's so much against us trying to get somebody in office. If we focus all of our assets on that, I'm afraid we're just not going to do what we want to do, which is roll back big government. But as a party, we have incredible power. That's my message to you today. We have incredible power in terms of fighting at the local, state, and national level on an issue basis. You know, we know how to organize. Obviously, we have 15,000 members. We, we get ballot access in 50 states often for our presidential uh, campaign. You know, we have power. What we need to do is apply it to the issues that we really can win. And if you think about it for a moment, if, if I were to say, if, if somebody were to say to me, okay, Mary, how do you think the Libertarian Party really can win office? You know what I'd say? Follow this strategy. Be heroes to the people. Be the ghostbusters they come to because people vote for their heroes. They'll vote for their heroes across party lines. That's the way to end the wasted votes. So if we do this, we might find we get elected. Wouldn't that be great? Yes. Well, I mean, just one more question. So yeah, I agree with you. I agree with everything pretty much you said about activism. And I want to tell people, I do a little bit of activism on my own party. And when you help people, that does get them to vote for you. We are not relevant to people in this state. Because we don't talk about things that they're interested in. We talk about things that we're interested in. We're not very good at selling liberty. I wanted to point out as a possible strategy, you do not have statewide initiative and referendum in New Jersey, but about 150 towns or so, more or less, have local initiative and referendum. Local towns pass things like rent control ordinances, taxi restrictions on the number of licenses to be issued. These are things within our grasp. We can go to these towns. We can pass an ordinance. We can put it on the ballot with INR saying we want to get rid of the you know X towns rent control ordinance or whatever is out there, or pass a good government ordinance requiring them to do better jobs of their meeting minutes and transparency. There are so many things we can do. 
And I've been sitting at these meetings since about 1988, and it seems like the Libertarian Party just doesn't get that. In New Jersey, we seem to focus on running congressional candidates. We seem to be doing things almost like we're not even thinking about what we're doing. And I think we have opportunities here to seize on to those types of issues which we're talking about, and the election victories will follow. But first, we have to demonstrate to people that we're doing something that makes us worth paying attention to. And I would love to see, and I don't know how to do that, I've been trying for years, but I'd love to see the Libertarian Party actually get to where it actually does things that are meaningful to the average people that pay taxes and live here. And, and I think so far, we failed to do that. And that's our problem. And the good news is that you don't need the whole party to do it, you know? A county can do it. Um, actually, a group of Libertarian Party members can get together and start that initiative. So if you like that idea, go for it, because right. I think that's where it is. Right now, John Pat does it, and we need more people to take him as example. Yeah, I ran for office once. It was, it was largely a waste of my time. <laughs> I ran as the only good thing about running for lieutenant governor is my mother was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to run for local office, and I'll tell you why. People ask me that. Because when you run for local office, you have to do things to serve the constituents that might not be of any interest to me. I don't want, I think I'm more effective operating as a litigant outside of the system, getting people, getting court orders to require governments to disclose things. I think those are better uses of an activist time than actually running and sitting as one member out of nine on a school board or a local council. That's just my position. I don't think that, I think that we shouldn't be running candidates and we should be running campaigns to change government in New Jersey. That's what we should be doing. I'd like to toot his horn a little bit. What he's doing is getting more positive attention the Libertarian Party in this state than I think anybody else that I've seen anywhere in the party.